Get back in two. Thank you. The Phaedrus, would you not agree? Okay. We started last week with Socrates' prayer. <coughs> And we asked you to reflect on it and tell us what you see in the prayer. And we jumped then to 274C, to this great statement. Do you know how you can act or speak about rhetoric so as to please God? Well, if one knew this, that is to say, knew how to act or speak about rhetoric, to, to uh, please God, might it not influence the way in which, if Socrates has mastered that, to exhibit those qualities or features in a prayer when he's praying to God, especially Pan, right, O oh, beloved Pan. And so we spent the evening looking at a couple of pages, did we not? Now I'd like to talk about the background necessary for rhetoric. That goes from 270 uh, to 274. So therefore, would you not agree that you have this and can apply it to this? Would it not be interesting to have this as a background? That's where we're going, right? So flip your pages open to 270. A, about. And I'll give you the quote. All great arts demand discussion and high speculation about nature. For this loftiness of mind and effectiveness in all directions seem somehow to come from such pursuits. This was in Pericles, added to his great natural abilities, for it was, I think, his falling in with Anaxagoras, who was just such a man that <laughs> filled him with high thoughts and taught him about the nature of mind and of lack of mind. Subjects about which Anaxagoras used chiefly to discourse, from these speculations he drew and applied to the art of speaking what it is of use to it. Right? Very interesting last phrase. And what is of use to it? Right? What is of use to it? Right? Is that a curious phrase? Mm. So, take a minute out, go over that paragraph, <coughs> take a look at it. We find it curious that this paragraph that we're talking about 
is puzzling, and so Fabius asks about it. And look at the answer he got. I mean, is that rather curious? <clears throat> now, what do you mean by that? The method of the art of healing is much the same as that of rhetoric. But he's saying, this paragraph we started with, behind it, you know what? It's pretty easy to understand. The method of the art of healing is the same as the art of rhetoric. Huh. Would you agree in that preceding paragraph the first sentence is explained in the second one all great arts demand discussion and high speculation about nature and this loftiness of mind and effectiveness in all pursuits seem somehow to come from such pursuits. Hmm. In all directions. Huh. Hey, this very thing is what Pericles added to his great natural abilities. Oh yeah? Yeah. Uh, it was, I think, his falling in with Anaxagoras was just such a man. <clears throat> Filled him with high thoughts and taught him the nature of mind and the lack of it. You're saying this rather interesting paragraph that we're taking off on. There's a method involved in that. So quite obvious, the method. <coughs> that method is the same in healing and rhetoric. The method, not the art. The method. Oh, by the way, uh, you can see that in Pericles because, you know, Pericles happened to have been a student of Anaxagoras who taught him about the nature of mind and the lack of mind. Uh, does that suggest lack of mind is a disease? And it has a method for curing it? And that mind, therefore, is the health of the soul? Mm. But in any case, notice the way he's setting it up. Big steps. Now he has to explain this, doesn't he? Certainly not obvious, is it? Well, we have a standard way of deciding whether something is obvious or not. Do we not? What is that way? Yeah, no, call on breath. <coughs> no, it's not obvious. I think we should keep reading. Okay, <laughs> then we're safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So, whatever follows, this should fit, shouldn't it? Right. That should be our goal. And then to tie it in as a background for this, yes. which we applied to this. All right. It's a good method. So, therefore, you should be puzzled, should you not? 
<clears throat> Matter of fact, it shouldn't make any sense if you're a good reader. Agree? Well, that, look here, Sean. Have you ever thought that there's a method behind rhetoric? Oh, you have. Oh, by the way, do you think it's the same as the method of healing? No. <laughs> He's saying it is. What a dope. <laughs> uh, by the way, he seems to attribute <coughs> that rather strange claim to someone that he studied with, perically studied with, who was really a man who exhibited all of the, that quality. And that's the chap who talked about the nature of mind and lack of mind. Huh. So if there's a need for discussion and high speculation about nature, maybe it's a nature or a nature because this is the nature of mind and lack of it. So in any case, we should have a couple of puzzles, should we not? Definitely. We don't if have not, any answers. We, can, we have puzzles because we don't have any answers to the questions. Right? We don't have any way of relating those terms the way the dialogue says they're related. Yeah, therefore. We're up a creek so far. Therefore? We need to read. We better as well read it. That's it. <laughs> All right. We'll take your suggestion. Yeah. Bill. I have a. You know, I keep reading this and it has these two words I keep running into mind and soul. And. and Mind and soul. Soul, yeah, where he uses soul, uh, says here, um... You have a problem with that? Yeah. And it's nature of mind and lack of mind, and then it says, um, just beyond that... Oh, I keep losing that thing. In the same <coughs> paragraph? No, not the same paragraph. Oh, no, paragraph. that's no. true. That's where we're going. Yeah, just beyond no, that. That's where we're going. So would you agree, if we are sufficiently puzzled, we can get a couple of readers and proceed. Fair? Yes. <coughs> Sir? Um, your comment about a nature, because when I read this study of nature, we're not talking about the big N. We're talking about the nature that is the forces within that particular nature. Well, that's 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 how we define nature here. Well, you're probably right. At this point, we don't know. I just no, wanted no. to make the point that I'm this is that in the original paragraph. He just talks about about nature, but this is a particular kind of a nature of mind. Well, but that's what I'm saying. A nature. Uh, that's different than than, big than natural world. That's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's so we'll hold that and go further. Right? Good, good, good. I'm willing to read. You are? Yo Tabien. All right. Which one? Uh, I want to play Socrates as usual. Okay. I'll do Phaedrus. <laughs> and you don't mind playing Phaedrus? No. How so? I like Phaedrus. How so? He's a good student. <laughs> I just wondered, how so? Because... Ah, uh, I'm reading. Like, yeah. <laughs> Come on, not pulling your leg. That's the next line. <laughs> Pierre, did you, did you bring up what Phaedrus means, by the way? Did you bring up what Phaedrus means? Of course not. The, the name Phaedrus. Of course not. I was just wondering. No, no, go ahead if you want. It means radiant, shining, and beaming. Oh, okay. So. That's good, good. Okay, how about it? We go? Okay, Saturday, let's hit it. There'll be no commercials. <laughs> Jump in. Dear Phaedrus, whither away and where do you come from? What? Oh, I'm sorry. We're now reading from the beginning? 270. Oh. I have this thing from the beginning. What are you reading out of V. Lobby low. Five, four, seven. 
547. Gotcha. Uh, whether one can acquire it so as to become a perfect orator, Phaedrus, is probably and perhaps must be dependent on conditions. Yeah, I've, that's true. Okay, I'm Can not you jump down to right the bottom of the page? Right. In both cases. Sorry, my Remember, bad. we instituted the slow reading school last yes. week, didn't we, Pierre? Thank you. Appreciate yes. that. Because people like to think as, long, as they read. So mm. Pierre said, he too. Hey, why don't you come up? Bring up your chair and <laughs> sit up and then we can have a nice read slow it. reading. <laughs> slow word. All right. And how about a chair for you? All right. Good, thank you. Both chairs, good. It's a gaming and reading chair. Flowery. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Together? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. because... Oh, yeah. For the picture, of course. Right. Claro. Ping pong. Right okay. <laughs> 270. Okay. All the great arts or some rendition? All there. great arts, yes? Yes, okay. right there. Ready, guys? All right. <clears throat> All great arts demand discussion and high speculation about nature. For this loftiness of mind and effectiveness in all directions seems somehow to come from such pursuits. This was in Pericles added to his great natural abilities, for it was, I think, his falling in with Anaxagoras, who was just such a man that filled him with high thoughts and taught him the nature of mind and of lack of mind, subjects about which Anaxagoras used chiefly to discourse. And from these speculations he drew and applied to the art of speaking what is of use to it. How do you mean that? <laughs> the method of the art of healing is much the same as that of rhetoric. Two, we have the two extremes. How so? Not slow enough. The method of the art of healing is much the same as that of rhetoric. How so? Well, I'll tell you. In both cases, you must analyze a nature. In one, that of the body, and in the other, that of the soul. If you are to proceed in a scientific manner, not merely by practice and routine, to impart health and strength to the body by prescribing medicine and diet, or by proper discourses and training to give to the soul the desired belief and virtue. You are probably right, Faster. Socrates. You gotta speed it up. Now, do you think one can acquire any appreciable knowledge of the nature of the soul without knowing the nature of the whole man? Could you read that again, please? See, the whole idea, Ingmar, was that some people can really cannot, their, their thought, so it's like we get behind, that and you're racing on ahead, and then we end up at the head way behind. So it really oh, was okay. a serious request that you read more slowly. Okay. I'll try. Now, do you think one can acquire any appreciable knowledge of the nature of the soul without knowing the nature of the whole man? Good question. If we are to believe Hippocrates, the Escalopade, we can't understand even the body without such a procedure. Well, he's right, my friend. However, we ought not to be content with the authority of Hippocrates, but to see also if our reason agrees with him on examination. Yes. Then see what Hippocrates and true reason say about nature. In considering the nature of anything, must we not consider first whether that in respect to which we wish to be learned ourselves and to make others learned is simple or multiform. And then, if it is simple, inquire what power of acting it possesses or of being acted upon, and by what, and if it has many forms, to number them, and then see, in the case of each form, as we did in the case of the simple nature, what its action is and how it is acted upon, and by what? Perhaps so, Socrates. At any rate, any other mode of procedure would be like the progress of a blind man. Yet surely, he who pursues any study scientifically ought not to be comparable to a blind or a deaf man, 
But evidently, the man whose rhetorical teaching is a real art will explain accurately the nature of that to which his words are to be addressed. To and be that is the soul, is it not? To be sure. Then this is the goal of all his effort. He tries to produce conviction in the soul. Is not that so? Yes. So it is clear that Thrasymachus, or anyone else who seriously teaches the art of rhetoric, will first describe the soul with perfect accuracy and make us see whether it is one and all alike or like the body of multiform aspect. For this is what we call explaining its nature. That's all. Right? You know now what he means by nature? Just as I suspected. And you better master that paragraph, which is key to the, the thing, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. 272. <clears throat> Then see what Hippocrates and true reason say about nature. Here it comes now, right? About nature. Considering the nature of anything, must we not consider first whether that in respect of which we wish to be learned ourselves and to make others learned whether it's simple or manifold, right? Right? And you should scratch your head and say, it doesn't seem to me that would take much training, perception to know whether something is simple or manifold. Mm. But you might call that as a problem. Because if it's simple, something follows, and if it's manifold, something <laughs> follows. If it is simple, inquire what power of acting it possesses. Right? What power? What power? Right, what kind of power? What kind of power? So he's got power. If it's simple, inquire what power of acting it possesses. Or uh, being acted upon. By what? By what? Hmm. And uh, if the thing <coughs> has many forms, Better, better be able to number them all, right? Exhaust them, number them all. <clears throat> and then, see in the case of each form, right? as we did in the case of the simple nature, what its action is and how it is acted upon and by what. Right. There's many forms. Take the other possibility, right? Then you better know the number. <coughs> I, right. oh boy, you better know that. Uh, what its number is, what it's acted upon. No, no. Hmm. I suspect you should keep that in your mind. Right. 
the two cases, if it's simple or it's manifold, what kind of power it has of acting and what acts upon it. If the form has many variations, then you'd have to make sure you've enumerated all of them <coughs> and go back and pick up what power it has and what it has acted upon it. Mm -hmm. Right? That right? You should have that pretty clear. <clears throat> Therefore, evidently, the man whose rhetorical teaching is a real art will explain accurately the nature of that in which his words are to be addressed, and that is the soul. Is it fun? <clears throat> so, see. <clears throat> You have the you have a great deal already here. See, rhetoric is a power. Rhetoric is a power. You also want to know what things are acted upon it. If it's acted upon something, is it simple? Oh. oh. What power it has going out? the things that affect it. Oh, by the way, if it's not simple, it's many. Therefore, if it's many or multiple forms, how many? The number? Right, exhaust to make sure you have the number of them all with the different kinds of forms it may have. And then pull off the same thing. Make sure you pull off that same thing. I should certainly want to know that. <coughs> So if there is an art of rhetoric, it's either simple or manifold, then you'd have to know what kind of power it has, what things act upon it, or given that it's going to operate on the soul, is the soul one or many, or does it admit of various forms, and if so, what are the finite number of forms that they possess, and therefore what kind of power each one would have, or what kind of things act upon it. Hmm. And if you don't know that, he says, you don't know the art of rhetoric. See, the art of rhetoric is going to be, you're going to have to approach each different kind of soul with a different kind of rhetoric, and you don't want to mix up the one for the other. So if the soul admits of a variety, many forms of soul, soul is one, but it may be multiple, then let us represent this by the different forms of soul, and therefore, if these are different ways of applying the art of rhetoric, there should be a proper arrangement for the forms of the art of rhetoric to its proper souls, since they are multiple. And you wouldn't want to mix them up, would you? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does he mean by nature? Next paragraph. Well, is, I have a question about the last paragraph. Um, is, it, is it an either or in the second case? It's either simple or multiform, but can something, uh, if it is simple, then we inquire what power of acting it possesses or being acted upon, could something have a power of acting and of being acted upon, or is it going to have either a power of acting or being acted upon? There can be a number of things that only have the power of being acted upon. Right. This doesn't have the power to act out of itself. Right. right? So therefore anything that has the power of acting it's going to therefore be susceptible to something that's acting upon it. Oh. Since all things can have an eff the effect of things operating upon it. Right. Okay. But not all things have the power of themselves to, to act. Okay, nature. And secondly, he will say what its action is and toward 
what it is directed or how it is acted upon and by what. Uh, 271B. Um, yes. Thirdly, he will classify the speeches and the souls and will adapt each to the other, showing the causes of the effects produced and why one kind of soul is necessarily persuaded by certain classes of speeches and another is not. I certainly think that would be an excellent procedure. By no other method of exposition or speech will this or anything else ever be written or spoken with real art. But those whom you have heard who write treatises on the art of speech nowadays are deceivers and conceal the nature of the soul, though they know it very well. Until they write and speak by this method, we cannot believe that they write by the rules of art. <sighs> And what way is that? It is not easy to tell the exact expressions to be used, but I will tell how one must write if one is to do it, so far as possible in a truly artistic way. Then please do. Since, is the, since it is the function of speech to lead souls by persuasion, he who is to be a rhetorician must know the various forms of soul. Now they are so and so many, and of such and such kinds, Wherefore, men also are of different kinds. These we must classify. Then there are also various classes of speeches, to one of which every speech belongs. So men of a certain sort are easily persuaded by speeches of a certain sort, for a certain reason, to actions or beliefs of a certain sort, and men of another sort cannot be so persuaded. The student of rhetoric must accordingly acquire a proper knowledge of these classes, and then be able to follow them accurately with his senses when he sees them in the practical affairs of life. Otherwise, he can never have any profit from the lectures he may have heard. But when he has learned to tell what sort of man is influenced by what sort of speech, and is able, if he comes upon such a man, to recognize him and to convince himself that this is the man and this, is, and this now actually before him is the nature spoken of in a certain lecture, to which he must now make a practical application of a certain kind of speech in a certain way to persuade his hearer to a certain action or belief. But when he has acquired all this and has added thereto a knowledge of the times for speaking and for keeping silence and has also distinguished the favorable occasions for brief speech or pitiful speech or intensity and all the classes of speech which he has learned then, and not till then, will his art be fully and completely finished. And if anyone who omits any of these points in his speaking or writing claims to speak by the rules of art, the one who disbelieves him is the better man. Now then, perhaps the writer of our treatise will say, Phaedrus and Socrates, do you agree to all this? Or must the art of speech be described in some other way? Surely we can't accept any other, Socrates. Mm. Still, it does seem a considerable business. Would you agree um, <clears throat> you should master that blankly paragraph? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Central. Take a look at it. All right. There's a lot in there, is there not? Pull it out. Up here, here. I I haven't read this uh, in some time, but does he give us some examples of those types? That yeah, he does. Yeah, that he talks about in this yeah. very. Mm -hmm. Because that would be very important mm -hmm. to master what's in that paragraph. Right. right 
if I'm 247 myself. If you're walking along with your friends who've studied rhetoric, um, and, uh, you stop and you see various people engaged in practical affairs, and you talk to your colleagues and you say, Hey, you see that guy over there? Uh, convince him to do other than what he's doing persuade him that what he's doing is not as good as what you're going to persuade him to be and to do? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Talk to your next colleague and say, by the way, see that guy over there having a glass of wine? Or a cappuccino? He's involved in some activity, is he not? What would he be involved in? Oh, they would say, well, he happens to be reading. Oh! a student. Okay, go over there and persuade him that of the things he should be reading, pick one that would fit ideally his soul. Uh, to, of course, make sure you have a very clear idea of the different kinds of souls so that you can immediately spot which class he belongs in and match the kind of persuasion you're going to be using as most appropriate for that kind of soul. Go ahead. That's Oh, by the way, when you come back, would you mind telling me uh, you are appealing to the soul? I guess there must be some method you're employing. Huh. You have to get to the kind of belief that's operating in his soul and appeal in one way or the other to some virtues. Of course, that's going to bring about a change, therefore you have to deal with a whole man. You're going to have to cite the reasons for what you're doing appropriate to that person and his particular level of soul or type of soul. And when you finish that, let's go down and each of you come down, we'll have a cup of coffee and you talk to me about how effective you were in trying to persuade the various people that I was assigned you to. Right. Here? <laughs> Doesn't it have to be the truth? Of what you're in? Doesn't it have, but it to, have be, to be a person? Does it have to be the truth that you're giving to this various soul? You can not, them not in this program. <laughs> that, that'd be quite a homework assignment. No, it's not. <laughs> it's what you'd want to do. Right. Ministers no, do it that. every Sunday. I can just I imagine. When you talk, just when you students. have a, a particular example, yeah, ministers do it every board, Sunday, and they get sometimes big in money for it. where you're you're recognizing that the individual isn't capturing what you're trying to express, or you're asking a question about, and you shift it to another topic, or you mm -hmm. give another mm -hmm. example, and you bring in maybe something else to it to help that individual. Um, so it's not a, you know, it, it's like um, being able to recognize in the individual that, number one, they're not understanding, and number two, there may be a different way to bring that person to, to hear your question. Okay, then, if one of the students came back and said, I, I creamed it. <laughs> <coughs> I would say, good, what did you do? <laughs> Nothing, I remained silent. Would that fit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Right, right. You have to know when to shut up and when to proceed, <laughs> right? <laughs> or to give pitiful speeches or intense speeches, right? Mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. oh, good, good. Uh, Pierre. Occasionally. Uh, in a certain sense, aren't there some different levels to this? No. And how? Okay, because, like, uh, it would seem to me that what Socrates referred to as the sophists would be, you know, like uh, people who give speeches and uh, 
people give them bunches of money, and even though the speeches are lies, the people believe it so thoroughly, you know, that you know they you know won't even take the money back when the person explains to them how they lied to them. I hope you're not talking about the Pope. <laughs> no, in this case, in this case, it was just Marjo Gordner. But any, well, I wanted to be any, 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 any per. I'm trying to be a little philosophical. Thank here, you, thank you, you know, thank you for correcting. Giving the giving the appropriate rhetoric, you know, uh, his sophistic, you know, pay, and not, you know, picking on anybody. But I mean, to me, it, it's it, the issue of of what you're talking about begins at that level where you're simply controlling the minds of people, period. Yeah. Not inspiring them at all. Oh, well, uh, even the wolf has an advocate, does he not? Yeah, and you bet. And should be allowed to have one? Well, there's, and how? there's a part of this, this, this section where he says, this is the man, the man who knows the truth about each thing is the man who is both able to avoid deception and to deceive another. Right, like, like, well, just I, was, I, I was thought I thought I was just addressing what Lyndon was saying. Is that yeah. this is the guy that knows how to fool people? Like, it's or it's a soul leading art. Wait a minute, wait for me. Or yeah, or tell them the truth. Yeah, but knows what time to tell them the truth and what time to lie to them. Depending upon the assignment. Yeah. Sort of like George. That's Bush. why I like the next two paragraphs coming up. All right, keep going. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Um. <laughs> 271? Two seventy one. Two seventy. No other way is possible, Two? Socrates. Uh, but it seems a great task to attain to it. Very true. Therefore, you must examine all that has been said from every point of view. <whistles> hmm to see if no shorter and easier road to the art appears, that one may not take a long and rough road when there is a short and smooth one. If you have heard from Lysias or anyone else anything that can help us, try to remember it and tell it. Um, That's it. As, as far as trying goes, I might, but I can suggest nothing on the spur of the moment then shall I tell something that I've heard some of those say who make these matters their business? Why, yes. Even the wolf, you know, Phaedrus, has a right to an advocate, as they say. Then you can put his case. Very well. They say that there is no need of treating these matters with such gravity and carrying them back so far to first principles with many words. For as we said in the beginning of this discussion, he who is to be a competent rhetorician need have nothing at all to do, they say, with truth in considering things which are just or good or men who are so, whether by nature or by education. For in the courts, they say, nobody cares for truth about these matters, but for that which is convincing, and that is probability, so that he who is to be an artist in speech must fix his attention upon probability. For sometimes one must not even tell what was actually done if it was not likely to be done, but what was probable, whether in accusation or defense. And in brief, a speaker must always aim at probability, paying no attention to truth, for this method, if pursued throughout the whole speech, provides us with the entire art. Your account, Socrates, precisely reproduces what is said by those who claim to be experts in the art of speech. I remember that we did touch briefly on this sort of contention a while ago, and the professionals regard it as highly important point. A highly. Well, and there is Tysias, whom you have studied carefully. Now let Tysias himself tell us if he does not say that probability is that which most people think. How could it be anything else? Apparently, after he had, had invented this clever scientific definition, he wrote that if a feeble and brave man assaulted a strong coward, robbed him of his cloak or something, and was brought to trial for it, neither party ought to speak the truth. 
the coward should say that he had not been assaulted by the brave man alone, whereas the other should prove that only they two were present and should use the well-known argument, how could a little man like me assault such a man as he is? The coward will not acknowledge his cowardice, but will perhaps try to invent some other lie and thus give his opponent a chance to confute him. And in other cases, there are other similar rules of art. Is that not so, Phaedrus? To be sure. Oh, a wonderfully hidden art it seems to be, which Tisius has brought to light, or some other, whoever he may be, and whatever country he is proud to call his own. But my friend, shall we say in reply to this, or shall we not? Say what? Well, Tisius, some time ago, before you came along, we were saying that this probability of yours was accepted by the people because of its likeness to truth. And we just stated that he who knows the truth is always best able to discover likenesses. And so if you have anything else to say about the art of speech, we will listen to you. But if not, we will put our trust in what we said just now, that unless a man take account of the characters of his hearers and is able to divide things by classes and to comprehend particulars under a general idea, he will never attain the highest human perfection in the art of speech. But this ability he will not gain without much diligent toil, which a wise man ought not to undergo for the sake of speaking and acting before men, but that he may be able to speak and to do everything so far as possible in a manner pleasing to the gods. For those who are wiser than we, Tisius, say that a man of sense should surely practice to please not his fellow slaves, except as a secondary consideration, but his good and noble masters. Therefore, if the path is long, be not astonished, for it must be trodden for great ends, not for those you have in mind. Yet your ends also, as our argument says, will be best gained in this way, if one so desires. Your project seems to be excellent, Socrates, if only one could carry it out. But it is noble to strive after noble objects, no matter what happens to us. Yes, of course. We have then said enough about the art of speaking and that which is no art. Certainly. But we have still to speak of propriety and impropriety in writing, how it should be done and how it is improper. Have we not? Yes. Do you know how you can act or speak about rhetoric so as to please God best? No, indeed. Do you? I can tell something I have heard of the ancients, but whether it is true, they only know. But if we ourselves should find it out, should we care any longer for human opinions? What a ridiculous question. But tell me the tradition you speak of. I heard then that at Naucratis in Egypt was one of the ancient gods of that country, the one whose sacred bird is called the Ibis, and the name of the god himself was Theuth. He it was who invented numbers and arithmetic and geometry and astronomy, also draughts and dice. That's where we were last week. Mm -hmm. What argument does he have against our friend Tisius? What's the argument against him? Because you don't need this method, no need for this method. Or you can reason just on probability. What argument does he have against that? That that the skill for producing probabilities is subtends um, the study of likenesses, the knowledge of likenesses. Isn't it? Isn't right. It's suspended from the, it's a subcategory, the, um, the skill for producing probable arguments uh, is um, in a su subclass, subdivision of uh, knowing the likenesses, knowing the truth, which would be knowing all the intervening likenesses between two opposites, like just and unjust. That's my the more, answer. The more you're talking, the lower your voice is going. <laughs> is there some reason why that's going on? Because I feel like you're going to shoot me down. Ah, me! 
Not Pierre really. the Agreeable, never. Never. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pierre so, the Agreeable, never. So that's as much, I think he's saying that's as much as we need to say to you about it. Hey, we, are, we already got that one. Did, did you miss it? Right, therefore, <laughs> let's all accept what he said is the right way to answer the question of what argument is against that position that's represented by Tissius. Right, good. Right, you'll accept that. And we can easily test it because if you can recollect what he just said, you get a free beer. <laughs> I mean, you'll be honored. You change your position twice, by the way. Yeah. Okay, well, in, the, in the text, he says, For you see, Tisius, what we are told by those wiser than ourselves is true. That a man of sense ought never to study the gratification of his fellow slaves. Well, I go along with that myself. Did that answer the question? Though? Well, but that's what I'm, oh, I'm oh, getting oh, to oh, here. Okay. okay. So, what he's saying from that part of the text is that this is the method, not what rhetoricians do in satisfying the desires of other slaves. That's his argument against their... Yeah, but what I agree with you that he's praising his own position. Yes. But what was weak about theirs? What was weak about theirs? Yeah, why did he reject it? On what grounds could he possibly reject it? Because certainly probability has always seemed to me the most probable way of reasoning, a probable argument. Probably. That's probably true. Probably, yeah. <laughs> John. So uh, he's, he's arguing for the for probability because people, well, people accept it because it's of its likeness to truth. Mm -hmm. But um, it's only he who knows the truth that is best able to discover likenesses. Nice. So you're quite right. If he said, you agree, that is what most people think. Therefore, their art of rhetoric can only be used for those kinds of people who fall in that class. And therefore, their art of rhetoric only addresses one type of person. Therefore, it doesn't have the scope that Socrates has just described. Could you go further, though? And uh, I think the point that Ekmar was close to is the advance beyond their position is that the very idea of probability is very important because probability rests upon its likeness to truth. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the person who knows the truth about things is most likely to be able to give a more probable account to, you know, to different audiences because he knows the relationship between likeness and truth and knows the way in which you can express that in probable arguments, right? Mm -hmm. And the, and unless a man take account of the characters of his hearers and is able to divide things by classes and to comprehend particulars under a general idea. No, no, no. See, if this, sometimes Socrates is making a point and he doesn't dramatize it, but is it not the case in this discussion in the quote that <coughs> Nuboya quoted, does he not say that probability, the people who rest their argument on pro probability, are only talking about a certain type of person, of people, and therefore their art is only effective to only that small area of people and not the others that are either higher or below that. Therefore it lacks scope, we would say. Right? It doesn't include as much as the art of rhetoric does since it only addresses only a small group of people, maybe numerically large, but in terms of classes, it's only one class out of many. Uh, like in, in, in the very section that Nobuya just read? Mm -hmm. It's curious, because that doesn't come out in the English as much. But, well, but, you, you're, but you're making the point. And yeah, I think that's great. Down, well, I mean, the Greek says, tois polois. So that's, that's the hoi polloi, the many. Mm -hmm. That's the specific class of people Good old hoi polloi back again. that the rhetoric works with. Yeah, yeah right. Thank you. But that's not in the English. It's, yeah. it's the people. 
Da. Da. Let's see the whole pole. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The mall. Back now. What's the background you need? Background. <coughs> right. And also, you should have an idea of what the truth is. But I like this curious line in here, which is rather interesting. Um, oh. Okay, we'd say we quit. And you know where we're going? Right. Let's pick it up the next major, time. The yeah. preceding section. Oh, Just the major, uh, major. Uh, okay. See, that was what I was driving at when we first started the discussion. It's not big in. It's the nature of X. Okay. I think if we soul. pick up from uh, so the boy, boy. and the maybe we can do ten pages, two sixty. As 261 to, to 270. Oh, okay. Sounds cool. This is the quote I was looking for. Where are you up here? Come here. That noble creature. And persuade the fair Phaedrus. That unless you pay proper attention to philosophy, you will never be able to speak properly, properly about anything. Mm. So, from this point on, we're going to get what he means by speaking properly, philosophically. Then we have that, the background, the key parts, which relate back to the dream, and we can now be in a better position to judge his ah, that's not it his prayer why? because then we want to apply it to the first three speeches, you see, that's where we're going four parts of the dialogue rhetoric Socrates' second speech his first speech and Phaedrus' speech, which is really from Lysias, right? Yes. And he says, these are terrible. Let's see whether this speech, when judged by the art of rhetoric, allows him to say that it is good and allows him the judgment that these two are terrible. Ideally, from this, this should produce a sickness and it should produce health of the soul. So that's where we're going. <laughs> okay.